Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Bryant, and welcome to the Nick Bryant Podcast. My guest today is Sarah Kendazor. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing good. Sarah wrote an amazing book called They Knew How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent. And I read it and I was really stunned by the revelations inside of it and her sleuthing. Could could you give us a general overview of the book, Sarah? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a hard book to describe. Basically, I try to draw a distinction between actual conspiracies, uh, you know, which are common, things like Watergate, Iran-Contra, 9-11, January 6th. I mean, we see them all the time. And this pejorative label of conspiracy theory, conspiracy theorists, which is slapped on people who are seeking to bring uh, the truth to light. And then I also look at kind of, um, you know, weaponized conspiracy theorists, the way people like, say, Alex Jones, uh, you know, are used uh, in order to discourage critical inquiry because they are such, you know, bad and malevolent actors that people don't want to be associated by them. You know, he tarnishes a cause by proxy because what I've seen, uh, especially in the last six years, but really for my entire lifetime, um, is elite criminal impunity. You know, is an ongoing crime spree by people in government, people in corporations, uh, with no consequences. And because there's been no consequences, people are left either believing that those parties must be innocent, or they're left looking at evidence, at, at little traces of evidence, little facts here and there, and they can't figure out exactly what's going on, but they know it's bad. So they take what's left of that evidence and they form a theory. Which I think is a natural thing to do. It's an act of civic inquiry, but they are demonized uh, for doing so in this climate. You know, the word conspiracy theorist um, has become kind of a dirty word. So I just, you know, I look back at basically the last 40 to uh, 50 years, sometimes before then, focusing on certain things, some things that um, overlap with your work in particular. Are you familiar with the uh, 1967 CIA dispatch about the problems with conspiracy theorists? There, there was a, a blowback against the Warren Commission because the Warren Commission was obviously somewhat fraudulent. And mm -hmm. the people that were questioning, the, a number of people were questioning the Warren Commission. So the CIA put out a dispatch, said that people that question the Warren Commission, let's call them conspiracy theorists. And, and then it cited a number of ways that a number of ways that conspiracy theorists would be pejorative. And it's very interesting because like the New York Times used conspiracy theorists once a year prior to that memo. And I think the Washington Post too. But after that, the term conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists just exploded exponentially. Mm -hmm. So that was... Whoever wrote that for the CIA, I mean, their family should be getting royalties because it's paid <laughs> off really well for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, one of the reasons it would have been used in that pejorative way is because the 1970s, I think more than the 60s, was a time where you had a rare kind of um, acceptance of conspiracies, not acceptance in the terms of people liking it, but people were acknowledging that conspiracies that had long existed, but were dismissed as fantastical were real, uh, you know, the Pentagon Papers, Cointel Pro, um, you know, MK Ultra, various activities that the Nixon administration was involved in. And there's a spirit of inquiry then that was, of course, immediately suppressed. And you can look at the 80s um, versus the 70s, look at Iran Contra versus Watergate, um, you know, to see how effective that that label is um, of conspiracy theory, because that's, of course, what was applied to anybody who probed, uh, you know, Reagan administration scandals. And then after 9-11, I think it really Really, uh, really held uh, people's spirit of inquiry down. And what attracted me to your book is we kind of bumped in on Twitter and either you or someone had tweeted um, something about Craig Spence. And I know Craig Spence very well. Craig Spence is dead, of course, but um, I've, he's shown up in two books that I've written, The Franklin Scandal and Confessions of a DC Madam. And Craig Spence was very much like the Jeffrey Epstein um, for the Republicans. He provided um, underage boys to Republicans, whereas Epstein provided underage girls to Democrats. I think that that is the primary partisan divide. And how did you learn about Craig Spence? 
I mean, I learned about him because I was looking at Epstein. Um, you know, I definitely see as sort of a bipartisan and international actor, you know, an espionage figure, um, a, you know, kind of consummate blackmailer. Um, but with Spence, you know, I, I was, I think I just found like Wikipedia, like something in the most basic form. And then I started reading the articles that it was linked to from the 1980s. You know, these Washington Post articles and for a time, the Washington Times articles uh, were still up. And, you know, my, my jaw dropped. I just thought this is exactly the same. And keep in mind, this is before the Epstein story was saturating the media. It was before Julie K. Brown's uh, work. And of course, before he was uh, re-indicted and allegedly killed himself in 2019. And I could not believe that the reporting on Epstein never mentioned Craig Spence because, you know, the manner of of abuse was the same. The surveillance was the same. His contacts within government were the same. The way in which he died, which hadn't happened yet, but that was ultimately the same. And when it was announced that, you know, Epstein had quote unquote committed suicide in this very dramatic fashion, which of course is the same thing that Craig Spence did in 1989, I was like, this is like a template. Like I'm, I'm watching the same story again. And I kind of thought, well, maybe they'll bring up Spence because I had tried to read as much as I could. I read your books. I went back. I tried to find the archives of newspapers at the time. And, you know, another commonality, though, of course, is that you flat out see uh, newspaper editors from the 1980s admitting we're not going to cover this. You know, we think it's relevant. We think it may be a new Watergate, but we're simply not going to cover it. And when they did cover it, you know, the Washington Post, for example, they did it in the style section. You know, they did it in this dismissive kind of almost jovial way, even though these are serious cases of child abuse, of abduction, um, and of, you know, government blackmail in which numerous uh, officials from the Reagan administration had to resign. Uh, there was a the beginning of a congressional inquiry, and then it went nowhere. And of course, the same thing happened with Epstein, you know, that was shut down by Bill Barr, and it was never investigated by Mueller or any of the predecessors, uh, you know, for the entire time that Epstein was uh, committing his crimes for multiple decades under multiple administrations. Richard Thornburg was uh, Bush one's attorney general initially, but he went to run for Senate in Pennsylvania. He had been the governor of uh, Pennsylvania before becoming the attorney general. And he was replaced by Bill Barr. Yeah. And Bill, and Bill Barr played an integral role in putting, putting the finishing touches on covering up the Franklin scandal. And then he shoulders covering up the Epstein scandal pretty much by himself just shuts it down. So Bill Barr, our illustrious attorney general, former attorney general, he shut down investigations into two pedophile networks. Yeah. And I think that's why they brought him back. They brought him back to, you know, cover up uh, the Mueller probe or just make sure it didn't go anywhere. Honestly, I felt the Mueller probe was very weak anyway. Um, and then I think they really brought him in to shut down Epstein. And of course, you know, his father, Donald Barr, uh, was the person who first hired Epstein and introduced him to New York High Society um, as a teacher in high school, even though he wasn't qualified for that. Um, on the side, of course, Donald Barr was writing sci-fi novels about intergalactic uh, pedophile networks. You know, it's a very normal thing to do. Yeah, there's a lot of strange things with Bill Barr's career. Um, the fact they even got into that role was because of these uh, plane crashes, you know, that happened in 1991 in a row where Senator Heinz uh, died in a plane crash, which is what called Cod. Um, you know, Thornborough to replace him, uh, therefore, you know, making uh, that Senate race possible and, and then changing Bill Barr from deputy attorney general to attorney general. The day that that was announced, you know, and I don't know if this is a coincidence, but I think it's weird, uh, was the day that Danny Castellaro, you know, who I mentioned also in, in my book, they knew was killed. Um, it's also the day that Epstein, uh, you know, allegedly committed suicide. It was August 10th. Um, it's the same day over and over. That could just be coincidence, but I do think it's um, it's strange, uh, you know, given that all of these people are involved in, you know, interlocking plots over multiple decades. As Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he would. <laughs> You discuss Danny Casolaro, and I've studied Danny Casolaro uh, pretty intensely um, when I first embarked on my sojourn with uh, with Franklin. Could you tell us a little bit about Danny Casolaro? 
Yes, uh, he was a journalist who was looking into the Inslaw Promise computer software um, scandal slash crime. Uh, this is a very complicated story involving uh, software that was, you know, stolen from a private company used by the government uh, for surveillance. Um, it was kind of a predecessor to a lot of surveillance software that we see today. Um, you know, it's kind of a long thing to go into. Uh, Kessler was also just broadly interested in a lot of um, actual conspiracies and state crimes of the Reagan era, including the October Surprise, including Iran-Contra. Um, you know, he his journalistic files, his personal notebooks, um, you know, are, have been archived. Um, you know, I went and drove out and, and saw them and looked through them. And honestly, you know, looking through those materials um, broke my heart. He was a very good writer. He had a proposal for his book, uh, which he called The Octopus. Um, he, he was able to tie a lot of these disparate strands uh, of corruption and abusive networks and, um, you know, international uh, mafia type bodies together. Uh, he also had a, a poetic style. And, you know, I felt somewhat invasive looking through his, his work, I kept thinking that it was never meant to be found like this. Like it was never meant to be found, you know, um, so many years later by, by a stranger, you know, all these passing thoughts, all these uh, ruminations. But, you know, I, I think if he had been able to publish this book, I think it would have made a difference. I also think it's possible they would have never let him publish this book because there has been a, you know, consistent effort uh, to bar knowledge of these trafficking networks, uh, whether it's trafficking children, trafficking arms, um, you know, all of these uh, horrific ties, uh, you know, they have tried to suppress this information for a very long time. And I think they've done it successfully to the point that when it's brought to the public's attention, as it was very much so in 2019, um, you know, after Epstein was proclaimed dead, um, you know, folks were almost, they were, they were overwhelmed by the sheer outlandishness of it. That was how it was perceived by people who weren't familiar with it. And then it just sort of, um, you know, it floats away. They, like I say in the book, you know, they used to bury these crimes with silence and now they bury them with noise. And so that's the point we're at in the digital era. And this is, is your, is your quote about the octopus, this uh, global criminality network, but I do know the octopus is real. The octopus is a global kleptocracy, the nexus where organized crime, state corruption, and corporate corruption meet, enabled by digital technology that allows the world's most vicious elites to operate across state lines and alter the global public's conception of reality. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think that's, the truth. And I think it shouldn't be so outlandish to say that very powerful actors, um, you know, are motivated by greed, are not motivated by good will. They'll continue to commit crimes if they get away with those crimes, if they're not held accountable. You know, we'll create, um, you know, elaborate propaganda systems to cover up their acts. We'll infiltrate Congress or infiltrate other bodies with dark money. I mean, this is this is baseline kleptocratic practice. And I think a lot of people uh, had some disbelief that the United States could function this way. You know, there were myths I was told as a child of the 80s. I was always told that the adults had learned, you know, from Vietnam to never get into a quagmire war again, that they had learned from Watergate that, you know, the executive branch cannot commit crimes unbridled. You know, like my generation, I think, was was saturated in this mythology, even though a lot of these crimes were carried out in plain sight right before our eyes. Um, and there's every right uh, to suspect them. And I also think as journalists, it's our job, uh, you know, to look at things critically, to gather the evidence, to not give the most powerful people the benefit of the doubt. So yes, um, you know, I'm appalled by the current coverage uh, of this, you know, of the Trump administration or the Biden administration. I think access journalism is what people seek, but it's like access to what? And at what cost? At what cost to you? At what cost to your soul? And at what cost to the public? You know, it's not just denied information, but is spoon-fed uh, propaganda that hurts the most vulnerable in our society. Danny Casalero ultimately uh, committed suicide or allegedly committed suicide in uh, Marriott Inn in West Virginia. And I can remember I'd been in on to Franklin for about eight months. And my first trip to Nebraska, I did have a death threat. And when I was in West Virginia, 
<laughs> trying to talk to someone. Um, <laughs> Danny Casalero is not far from my thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's something, <clears throat> you know, anyone who touches these topics has to live with. And, you know, I've, I've had things happen when I look into Casalero materials. You know, it's ironic that we live in this time of rampant criminality. And one of the things I was most worried about people coming after me for was, you know, looking at the files of a long dead man. But, you know, there, there's something there. And it is it is very complicated. I think you need, um, you know, a good financial knowledge, good technological knowledge to really work your way through it. Um, but he was on to something and people don't want us looking at it. I think in part because, you know, as you mentioned, so many of the players of this are, are still alive, still among us, still active in government in the way that Bill Barr was. Uh, it's not the distant past. You know, we're just living in a sequel, um, you know, of a book that should have been closed long ago, uh, but was not. And you say in your book, you are not supposed to want to slay the octopus. You are not supposed to recoil at its touch. You are supposed to crave access to it. And with that access, you become part of it, another tentacle. And people, I was, um, I dated a uh, producer. She produced a, um, uh, a daytime soap and um she said to me that anybody who has the opportunity to sell out will sell out. Um, I'm an example of someone that didn't sell out, even though I, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to sell out. But um, but as you say in that quote, I mean, the pull of the octopus is very, uh, there's a lot of gravity there because it'll enable you to actualize your dreams. Yeah, I think it depends on what <laughs> folks' dreams are. And I don't think I share their dreams. I mean, I don't, I want enough money to survive, but that's not my interest. I'm not, I don't have materialistic kind of interests. I don't want fame. I definitely don't want to live in New York City or DC. I don't want to have a job where I work for a corporation. Like, I just want my freedom and I want to see justice. And I think that that is impossible to do under a mainstream journalistic system. And I'm, you know, I've had those offers, I've had those job offers and you know, I've walked away. Um, and the closest I have is, you know, I, I have these books that are published by a major publisher, uh, you know, which is a minor miracle. We'll see how long that lasts. But, you know, I, I think what's important is, you know, can you sleep with a clear conscience? Like, can I be a good example for my own children? Can I be a good example for other people who may want to pick up these topics? I think when we see people with access, with power, utterly abandoning, uh, you know, the, the subjects that you and I are looking at, which means abandoning the victims, which means abandoning the pursuit of justice, which means streamlining and mainstreaming um, absolutely horrific crimes. Like, I, I just, I don't want any part of that. And it's like, does it cost me? I mean, sure. But like, I'm not suffering at the extent that the victims of those crimes are. So I don't know. I mean, it's real kind of dry to me. Like, I just feel like it's morally wrong. It's morally wrong to cover these things up. And it's morally wrong to financially benefit from that cover up. And I just don't want anything to do with it. So. And when you were talking about Danny Casalero, I was pleasantly surprised that you pulled up the Vanity Fair hatchet job um, on Danny Casalero, uh, written by Ron Rosenbaum. It was, uh, Danny Casalero was onto a number of things, and a number of things that he investigated turned out to be reality. Uh, yes. BCCI, Iran-Contra, um, the Insla Promise software scandal. I mean, these became valid realities. But uh, Ron Rosenbaum wrote an article for Vanity Fair essentially saying that Danny Casalero was delusional. <laughs> yeah, and the, he used the conspiracy theorist trope yes. too. He said he conspiracy theory fever and that the whole nation was suffering for it. And then he kind of grudgingly admits that they're living in the era of you know, Iran Contra. And also this is when all the, uh, you know, white collar crime uh, lords were getting arrested in New York City, like Helmsley and Milken and Boski and all this. So nothing he was looking at was all that um, unfathomable. But yeah, he was smeared, uh, you know, from beyond the grave. David Korn did, uh, you know, some of a hatchet job as well. You know, one thing that's interesting to me about Ron Rosenbaum is that he was one of the few people who was uh, forthright in 2016 about the threat of Trump, about Trump's long held interest in nuclear weapons, you know, about these things. He, he brings us to the, the fold later. He interviewed him in 1987. 
But I'm thinking, you know, at what cost? Like, why were you not upfront with this back then? And why would you go after somebody like Casalero, who was simply trying to get to the bottom of, you know, these very, very difficult stories? And there's this almost expectation of perfection. Like, he's supposed to unilaterally solve all of these things when he was in the midst of a very difficult, very high risk investigation for which he paid with his life. So yeah, I was really disappointed um, to see those sorts of articles. And I also thought it was uh, illuminating about how journalism works. I think that there is a incentive, like if you trash this man, if you say that what he was investigating was, you know, fraudulent or baseless or wild, then you get more credibility by, by proxy. I think that that was the mode of thought. I don't think it was necessarily a personal attack from him. I think it was just, this is how you show that you're willing to play the game. But I, I think it's really wrong and incredibly disrespectful uh, to what Castellero was doing. To me, it shows, and as I've mentioned, he, uh, Danny Castellero was onto a number of realities and that were highly criminal. And I think that if those realities didn't pan out to be highly criminal, that hatchet job on him never would have been written. That, yeah. that's, my, that's my belief. I think so, too, especially in in 91, when I do feel like a lot of these issues were coming to the fore in a way that they had not in the 1980s, where they'd been somewhat successfully buried. There's like a little flicker of light um, that was getting in there. This happens now and again, and then it's snuffed out. And you also talked about uh, Mark Lombardi, and mm -hmm. he was also he also committed suicide. Could you tell us a little bit about Lombardi? Yeah, I mean, just to clarify both the Casalero and Lombardi families question the suicides, you know, they think that they were murder. Um, Mark Lombardi was a conceptual artist uh, who was interested in basically transnational organized crime, interlocking networks of state corruption. And he would draw these, you know, very detailed photos. Um, you know, there's that famous image of like a man with a you know red string on a cork board, that kind of thing. But he did it that, um, you know, not with string, but by paper in a very artistic way. And he did what a lot of folks do when they're studying, uh, you know, actual conspiracies, and they know they're going to be dismissed as some sort of, you know, hyperbolic conspiracy theorist, which is he kind of played with it, he sold it as art. But it, what he actually had done was an enormous amount of research about state crimes, including the networks of the Bush family, uh, the Saudis, and people tied to, you know, what became the 9-11 attacks. And he was doing this well before then, you know, he, his death was in 2000. Um, and so eventually, you know, his work was relatively well known. It was displayed in museums. It was removed from, I think it was the Whitney Museum by the FBI, uh, his, his work on Bush, because it was uh, too illuminating. And the thing is, you know, both with Castellaro and Lombardi, and to some extent with me, is that, you know, we don't know all the answers. And I, I always try to be clear when I don't know all the answers, when I'm, when I'm speculating, when I have partial evidence, because, you know, I think that's the only way you could be trustworthy. But they are asking very dangerous questions. And they were showing networks uh, of criminality that were undeniable and that involved some of the most powerful actors in the world. And there were clearly people who wanted uh, to silence them. And when you can't destroy somebody's reputation, I think then, then they go after your life. With, uh, with uh, Danny Casalero, I think that my life was saved because of his life um, not being saved. Um, and what I mean by that is Danny Casalero was murdered and or died very mysteriously. And all these, these criminal things were eventually came to the fore and he became a martyr. Yeah. And I believe that, the reason why my life was spared after I had a death threat and I still continue to work on Franklin is because of Danny Casalero. I believe that uh, the malignant corner of intelligence that does pander children and blackmail people and commit securities fraud and all kinds of other stuff. Um, I believe that that dark malignant corner didn't think I could ever get the book published and that I could ever get the story. And mm -hmm. um, so 
I did get the book published. I did get the story, but I've never, it's been very hard to, to get it traction because it, if you look at the Franklin allegations on the Wikipedia page, it reads completely insane. Um, oh not, yeah. And, and I watched the editing of that page. I looked yes. at how the edits were done. I watched the, you could watch the process of attempted burial in real time. And like, yes, yeah, that that's what made me wonder about, you know, what Larry King was doing now. But, you know, it's like your book, I think, you know, it's very relevant. It's obviously relevant because of Epstein, because of similar operations, but also because, you know, I was actually rereading it the other day, the Clarence Thomas information, the ties between Larry King and Clarence Thomas, I think are of interest to the American public. Um, and I don't know, I really doubt the networks would ever let you on. I mean, hell, they won't let me on to talk about baseline <laughs> things like, hey, there was an attack on the Capitol January 6th. So like, things everyone's witnessed, but it's important because like I was saying, it's, it's recurring characters. It's people who form networks. It really seems to kind of, uh, you know, revolve around the Iran-Contra era and then just continue into the presence. And they become more and more insular um, as time goes on because they all know each other's secrets. With Clarence Thomas, he is a demented individual. And Jane Mayer wrote a book called Strange Justice. And she talked about Clarence Thomas's various uh, um, immoralities or uh, just debauchery, and um, he was a, he's a complete misogynist. Um, there were a number of women that were going to testify against him. Um, it wasn't going to only be Anita Hill, but Biden quashed their testimony, especially Angela mm -hmm. Bright. She was there. And and it's kind of funny because if you look at what Clarence Thomas has voted for, it's antithetical to Democratic ideas. Um, Shelby uh, County versus Holder, which completely uh, rolled back the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. um, Citizens United versus Federal Election Committee, which basically said corporations can spend as much as they want on getting people elected. And then um, um, Adirond Construction versus uh, Pena Thomas, which rolled back affirmative action, which enabled him to <laughs> go to college and law school and work for the Equal Opportunity Commission. Yeah. So Clarence Thomas is, I believe, highly compromised. And, and Joe Biden allowed him to be on the Supreme Court which you would think the Democrats wouldn't elect Joe Biden to be dog catcher because he let someone on the Supreme Court who's voted against everything that the Democratic stand for that that the Democrats stand for. But no, there there they are. Biden yeah. is our president and Clarence Thomas is our august Supreme Court justice. Yeah. And it's hard for me to believe that Joe Biden didn't know about all of this. I mean, Joe Biden was present, at least as a witness, you know, for a multitude of these incredible corruption scandals. He certainly was involved in suppressing information about them for potentially reaching the public like, through the testimony during these hearings. And, you know, when I bring this up, people like I'm not anything. I'm an independent who, you know, of course, I'm going to vote for the Democrats when I live in Missouri and my alternative is like Josh Hawley or whatever. But, you know, basically, I don't like anybody. But folks, uh, they look at everything through this horse race lens. And I'm like, no, this is serious. Like, this is about deep, entrenched governmental corruption. It's so entrenched and so deep that, of course, it incorporates both parties, especially if you've been in government for 50 years, as Joe Biden has. So it's worth looking into what he knew and when he knew it and, you know, in what manner, if at all, uh, he's involved. But we have this uh, atmosphere where those are just, um, those are questions that, you know, you get highly discouraged uh, from asking. I think people uh, get blackmailed or compromised, but I also think that people are, what I've seen with the Franklin scandal, there are actors that I know who are compromised in that book, but then there's people that were, were willing to sell their grandmother for power. Mm -hmm. There's that aspect too, that people are amoral uh, or sociopathic and they don't need to be compromised because they're, they're, they're just gluttons for power. Yeah. Or they're the type of people who commit so many sociopathic and awful acts that 
they are more apt to be compromised for other ones. You know what I mean? Like yes. they're willing to commit some and they don't care who sees them, but then there's some that they don't want, you know, out there. And then they're easy to spot. They're easy to manipulate. And our system is designed, I think, to elevate those actors into positions of power. And then they protect those positions. You know, they can be relied on to vote certain ways to allow, uh, you know, certain people to escape scrutiny or uh, escape prosecution. And, uh, you know, because investigative journalism, I think, has been so defunded and because the impetus is to uh, withhold information in exchange for access, in exchange for money, instead of share information with the public, it's easier for them to get away with it. I, I've i said this before, so I know that some of my listeners have heard me say this, but I was able to talk to a blackmail photographer in the Franklin Network, and um, he'd been treated very badly, and so he was willing to talk wasn't the most, uh, he was a little unctuous um, and definitely had a tenuous connection to the truth. But there are things that he said that were, that struck me as true. And he said, once you're compromised or you're willing to make a Faustian pact, it's like you're on a yacht and it's a beautiful day and you're on this yacht and you can have anything that you want. But if you decide to get off the yacht, then the people on the yacht are going to make sure that you drown. Mm -hmm. And I think that our leaders are on the yacht. Yeah, I think so. And I think when you have a gerontocracy, like we currently do, those leaders have been on the yacht for literally my entire life. You know, they began a lot of these crime plots when I was an infant and they've continued them uh, to the present day. And that makes things worse and worse. I think that's also why we see so much nepotism, because when you have these uh, entrenched circles of elite criminality, you need people who will keep secret. You need people who have, uh, you know, knowledge of the playing field, who have, you know, a stake in the game, who don't want to see their own relatives, uh, you know, be punished. So they continue the process. And now they've broken down so many uh, barriers, you know, so many points of leverage. You know, we've lost voting rights. We've lost the leverage of protest, I think. You know, I saw that clearly with uh, the Iraq war, but, you know, in the two decades after, you know, you still see that. Uh, we've lost the leverage of the media because the media itself has been drained. Uh, and they they know that. So you're sort of left thinking, well, what is what is worth pursuing? And I still think that the truth is worth pursuing, you know, no matter who finds it and when, you know, whether it's me looking at Castellero's files, uh, you know, 30 years after the fact, or maybe somebody looking at your work or my work 30 years after the fact, like it matters. And it matters because people got hurt and, and there wasn't justice. And I think that that matters in its own right. You know, so I try to sort of hold on to that. Um, but the passage of time, and all of this, uh, you know, unpunished, uh, you know, criminality, uh, it, it's depressing. I mean, there's no way to kind of argue around that. You know, it, it's a lot. It's a lot to take. Well, you this is a, a quote from your book. The character of the conspiracy theorist has been weaponized by those seeking to protect a corrupt status quo at all costs. And as we talked about the 1967 CIA document about framing people that were skeptical of the Warren Commission as conspiracy theorists. That has just been, now conspiracy theory is so pejorative. Um, anytime it gets mentioned, most people just shut down um, because it, it's become, it's, it, conspiracy theory has become a four letter word. Yeah, I'm trying to reclaim it. I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> put forth the, uh, image of the upstanding conspiracy theorists, because seriously, after the last, you know, six years in particular, I think most Americans have theories about ongoing conspiracies that they see with their own eyes. I think they're curious. I think they're inquisitive. I think they get battered down by a system that's constantly telling them that they're crazy and that they're imagining things. And they also, of course, are battered down. And I talk about this in the book by this idea that if things really were that bad, if these atrocities were really being committed, then someone would surely step in and stop them. And then someone else would alert the public about what they'd done. And that's just not the case. And so I'm trying to kind of snap people out of that mentality, you know, and of course, this isn't pleasant to hear. You don't want to hear that no one is coming to the rescue and that, you know, a lot of our institutions or most of our institutions are deeply corrupt and have uh, failed us or are actively working against us. But that's the pathway out is just, uh, you know, realizing the severity of the situation. Then you can get together with other people and maybe try to, you know, figure out uh, some kind of 
remedy. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having theories about what is happening in American politics, as long as you're using evidence and facts, as long as you're not fabricating things, libeling people. Like people associate conspiracy theorists with like the Alex Jones of the world, who I think of as just hateful, malevolent propagandist, like a propagandist first and foremost, not somebody with a true spirit of inquiry and someone who masks himself behind, oh, I'm just looking for, you know, the truth. But that's not it. They go in with a preconceived notion and then they exploit people's incredible vulnerability about very serious events like 9-11 and other things that he's, uh, you know, discussed on his show. Alex Jones has certainly been a bane to anybody that is taking parapolitics seriously. And it's unfortunate. He has a lot of followers that, that listen to him. And um, he's, he is himself a character. And you also said those seeking to oppose criminal elites need to abandon their careerist concerns in favor of the truth and justice, no matter the reputational damage that 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 will incur as a result. And have you experienced that yet? The, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, absolutely. You know, I mean, my whole my whole life, you know, even when I was in academia and I, I was studying Uzbekistan, I mean, nothing I've done has ever been through the normal routes. Um, you know, and I do worry about social media getting dominated by a lot of tech uh, tycoons with, um, you know, algorithms that suppress information because that would be the most effective way to, to shut me up, I suppose. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, some of it though is like i'm not saying i made some great sacrifice in this respect because i don't want that kind of job like, i worked at the new york daily news for three years i know what a corporate media job is like i know what's expected of you i know the lack of freedom that's there and i don't want it and if i have the opportunity uh, to investigate the subjects that i think are important to write in the style that i think it is you know mine um you know to be creative to take risks then i'm gonna do that. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll stay afloat. Uh, it's worked out so far, but you know, I could have written a different book after hiding in plain sight. Like that was a, a New York times bestseller. I wanted to write this book because I, you know, I had a two book contract and I felt like, well, this is the opportunity to get the, uh, the Craig Spence stuff, the Danny Casalero stuff, the Mark Lombardi stuff, the Epstein and Maxwell stuff, or the sequel to it in there. And to maybe, I don't know, hopefully change people's minds about their preconceptions of like, what is a conspiracy? What is a conspiracy theory? So they don't have this gut reaction. And so that they do look at things in an inquisitive and honest way. Um, Cause I don't think that that's a lot to ask. And I think a lot of people feel uh, gaslit and they feel attacked for just having a um, you know, basic uh, civic inquiry. And I don't think that was always the case. I mean, I may be romanticizing it cause I wasn't alive for it but in the sixties and seventies. It doesn't seem that it was that way. Like it was encouraged to challenge authority, to question power, to do investigative work. And of course there was a whole infrastructure for that. It doesn't exist anymore, but I think we need it back. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And the, uh, the price I pay, I mean, I don't know people have been through worse. See what happens. A really good point you make in your book and you make it, uh, you hit on the theme, um, a few times and we've talked about this a little bit, but, uh, a blatant conspiracy by the powerful is less likely to be called a crime because people tend to equate getting caught and getting punished with crimes. And if you look at all the crimes that have been committed by our leaders and no one gets indicted, people forget. Mm -hmm. And um, there, are, I think of just right off the top of my head, think of all the Epstein perpetrators. Look at the Black Book and look at all the Epstein perpetrators. And none of them have been indicted. I, I mean, the house manager circled the ones that he saw um, engaged in criminal activities with um, Jeffrey Epstein. And they've been corroborated by at least one of his victims. But they're they're untouchable. They haven't been touched. And uh, yeah. they're, they're going to stay on the yacht and enjoy the day. Yeah, and it, it's disgusting. I think it's a combination of the DOJ and the FBI, which are often in on these plots, you know, which are participants in these plots. You know, you see this often with, um, you know, mafia activity as well, with the FBI has 
neighborhoods that went on to work for the Russian mafia, which, you know, was a, a proxy of the, uh, the Epstein operation. But, you know, you look at somebody like Alan Berchowitz, who's not just uh, Epstein's lawyer, but also a client. And then you see, you know, well, how is this man covered uh, in the media? It's like they write about is Hampton's parties, you know, it, it's their social circle. Like that's another thing that I think changed in journalism is that a lot of the reporters are, are from the same social rarefied worlds as these elite predators. And so they're not going to give up the game. They're not going to uh, puncture that reality. And occasionally you see articles even about that. You know, there was a, a Daily Beast article, I think from, from 2011, about these parties that New Yorkers, wealthy New Yorkers would have Epstein was there, and this was after he'd been invited, and they knew he was a pedophile, they knew he was a child trafficker, and they didn't care. Nothing mattered to them except for money and uh, secrets, which they were all too happy to keep. Um, and so it's, it's a combination. It's people being willing to accept uh, things that should never be accepted um, as normal. And I don't know whether it's uh, greed or just utter, you know, sociopathy or immorality, but it's become kind of expected behavior in certain worlds, worlds that I, I don't want any part of, because uh, they frighten me. They frighten me in how casually evil they are, you know, how unthinking they are of, about the victims of this abuse. It doesn't even enter their minds. With a number of them, Hannah Arendt's quote, uh, the banality of evil comes to mind and i've she she applied it towards uh adolf eichmann but there are a number of bureaucrats that go along to get along um that could actually be very powerful voices for truth but they're not going to risk it and yeah says, go ahead go ahead Oh, no, I was just thinking of the quote itself that most people don't make a conscious choice you know to be good or to be evil, um, you know, they just sort of bend with times. And I, I think that's an important thing for people to think about, to just think about it in their own life, uh, because I think we're in a we're in an evil era, um, you know, but everybody, regardless of us losing control over other things, our political system, the economy and so forth, you know, you do have control of your morality. Uh, you know, you can decide what kind of choices you make and how you treat people and what you view as important. So I just, I would urge people to read her work on that. And you say that the goal of criminal elites and autocrats is to make the pursuit of truth and justice seem worthless or a matter pursued by the unhinged. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and you see that in countries all over the world. This is definitely not an American phenomenon. They try to exhaust you. They try to beat you down. Uh, it, it's often very successful. Um, and I think it is in part, though, because so many people are so concerned about their reputation or their career or these very sort of traditional uh, career paths with being, you know, with conforming to certain ideas of, of what a journalist should be. I don't know. There's a there's a dearth of imagination. I think social media has been bad in this way because it quantifies everything. It has people measuring themselves by likes or retweets. Or, or things like that, instead of the quality of their work, the integrity of their work, you know, the quality of their character. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the, the more people will just kind of um, emerge. You know, I have actually been impressed in the last like 10 years about people who are willing to pursue these topics, despite the difficulty and the threats um, and the darkness of it all. And they do it because they care about, you know, who is being hurt. And there always have been people like that, and they usually are not respected in their time. Uh, but that's not the point. You know, the point is, is to do the best work you can because it's the right thing to do. And I got I really got a kick out of this quote, sounding bad shit crazy when relaying when relaying the plain facts of a 21st century political conspiracy is often a mark of an honest broker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's true. It's like whenever I would try to tell somebody who's just never heard of any of this stuff, what the Epstein Maxwell case was, what Craig Spence was, when I would include, you know, quotes from them and all of these things, like, you know, they, they thought I was nuts, or they thought I was, um, you know, reading really uh, baseless kind of reporting. And I'd be like, where are you finding this? And like the New York Times, the Washington Post, like, this is all in the public domain. Same thing, of course, uh, is true with a lot of uh, Trump's activity. If you quote him directly, uh, people think you're lying or making it up or at least that's the case in, uh, in 2016. I think uh, folks have become accustomed to it now. Yeah, there's this tendency in the media, you know, to play everything down, to soften it. They don't want to call a crime a crime. They don't want to call a lie a lie. And they don't want to call a pedophile a pedophile, you know, or, or mention 
uh, that, you know, individuals like Prince Andrew and Ehud Barak and Alan Dershowitz and so forth are pedophiles, are, are people who've been brought to court and sued and paid settlements like that. This isn't spurious. This isn't gossip. Like these are real cases, um, but they will, you know, put their royal affiliation or their uh, political uh, title before uh, bringing that up. I mean, I feel like it should just be brought up endlessly whenever they're mentioned. But, you know, that's just me. They are super predators, and thus far, they have not been punished. And you also say that, uh, and I kind of got a kick out of this, and it's um, it, it it shows uh, kind of a, a certain despondency. Um, <laughs> all conspiracy theories are debatable, except one. The American government will absolutely leave its citizens to die. <laughs> Yeah, this is a fun, a fun, uplifting book for your audience. <laughs> Be sure to curl up with this one at the beach. Um, I mean, yeah, I, you know, sorry to say it, folks. I, I think people do know this. I think everyone who just lived or is living through COVID pandemic is certainly aware of this. I think COVID honestly has shed some light on 9-11 uh, because there is a, this idea or illusion that the government would go to great pains to make sure that no terrorist attack would ever hurt the American people because 3,000 people was an unbearable casualty for us to endure as a nation. And of course, then you see 3,000 people dying every day and they just blow it off and blow it aside. And, you know, there there is a casualness um, about death and a cavalier attitude uh, talking about it that I, I think is just, uh, it, it's sadistic. It's, it's incredible. I mean, it's way beyond inappropriate. That, that's the word I, I wanted to say. But yeah, I mean, this is true. And I think if you go in with the baseline, looking at history, looking at precedent, looking at facts um, of how America has treated its citizens, especially traditionally marginalized communities, vulnerable communities, you know, yes, they will leave us to die unless, you know, we uh, stand up for each other and we stand up for ourselves. Um, and I, I don't think folks should have an illusion about that, no matter where they stand on the political spectrum. And at a certain point in your book, you start talking about these uh, conspiratorial movements or communities, and you say, devoid of direction, stripped of stability, people increasingly cling to personality cults, religious cults, ideological cults, cults of bureaucracy, and cults of conspiracy. And from my perspective, QAnon really has hurt what I've tried to do. Yes. And... It's, but I understand why it has flourished. People are looking for something to believe in. Um, they're they're rudderless, mm -hmm. and they desperately want something to believe in um, that Donald Trump is going to save the children. I mean, Donald Trump didn't even indict all the Epstein perpetrators. So mm -hmm. I don't know how Donald Trump is going to save the children or ha even showed a willingness to save the children. But yet QAnon still exists after Donald Trump let off the, all those Epstein perpetrators walk, which you would think that that would be the disintegration of that movement, but, but, it, but it wasn't, it hasn't. People just still want to believe that. Yeah. I mean, it's like one of those apocalypse cults that proclaims the end of the world and it doesn't happen and they move the date along. And, and I think with QAnon, um, you know, there was a core grain of truth in this morass of lies that was QAnon, which is, of course, uh, child trafficking and rape uh, by political officials used for blackmail and in international networks around the world, which is, again, this is an example of the kind of thing that sounds actually crazy to people who don't know about it. But I think most people know at least about Epstein. I don't think they necessarily know about Franklin or, or Spence or other cases. But when they find out that there's this, you know, long uh, pattern that, that has never been, um, you know, brought to justice, then they are horrified. And with QAnon, you know, I, I would watch these folks and some of them did decent research. You know, they were really uh, trying to root things out, looking at old articles, looking at primary sources, doing what a researcher would do, while at the same time, you know, uh, believing a lot of things that were just objectively not true. And I think they found community within there. I think they were like, all right, I found other people that care about what happened to these kids. And I think it gave them a sense of belonging and a sense of hope. And I understand that. I would sometimes get emails from them because they would find 
hiding in plain sight. And they were sometimes um, surprised by the fact that, of course, Trump was accused by an Epstein victim of rape when she was 13 years old. And, you know, they were surprised that their their hero uh, could possibly be implicated in this manner. Um, you know, but they I think someone in with good faith, someone in with extreme uh, motive of exploitation, meaning to take this group and weaponize it for either for politics or for violence. And it is still going today. And I think the reason it's still going is there hasn't been justice, is there hasn't been justice for the, the victims of Epstein. There hasn't been clarity about how that operation functioned and who it benefited. There hasn't been clarity about the manner in which Epstein died. And there's been no historical context. I mean, these are individuals who are stripped of all historical context whenever this is discussed. Like, Franklin should be brought up. Craig Spence should be brought up. Ray Cohn uh, should be brought up. Uh, and it's all just vacant. It's all just as if he magically appeared, uh, you know, in, in 2019, was arrested and then died, like a little abbreviated fairy tale. And folks know that's not the real deal. It doesn't take a lot to figure that out, you know. Last summer, I'm, I'm from Minneapolis. And last summer, I was in Minneapolis. And um, I was with uh, some... Uh, my one of my uh, brothers or one of my friend's brothers and um we we're with a couple of people and these are the most non-conspiratorial people that you will ever meet and i didn't they didn't know who i was um I, we had just met them or i just met them and um and then all of a sudden epstein was brought up and you could tell that their little on, antennas went up and they said, you know, I don't think he killed himself. <laughs> and then my friend uh, said, this is the guy that put Epstein's black book on the Internet. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then that kind of got their attention a little bit. So, yeah, that, but but we're talking people that don't have a conspiratorial bone in their body knew that something was seriously awry with Epstein. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he crossed over like there is a time where I was sort of, you know, grimly saying like Epstein is the glue holding America together because you see us falling apart at the seams, but everybody, uh, you know, hates Epstein and Maxwell. Everyone, I, except for the, the perpetrators, wants justice, wants clarity. Um, and, you know, he was a symbol of everything that was uh, deeply, deeply rotted um, and evil, you know, within government, within intelligence and within just um, abuse, you know, within uh sanctioned abuse um, by by officials. And so, you know, as of now, in 2022, what I'm seeing is people kind of moving away from the story, you know, like I wrote, and they knew he was kind of memed into inscrutability. There's so much information, there's so many con contradictory stories that people kind of abandoned it. But what I'm seeing now, honestly, this environment, it reminds me of 2002. It reminds me of after 9-11, when criticism of the government was so highly discouraged because people were very afraid and it was thought of as unpatriotic to kind of investigate all of these issues. I think we had kind of a break in that for a while in 2019 and 2020, where you really saw inquisitiveness. Um, and now we're veering back in that direction. But yeah, everybody, this is the thing people agree on. Epstein and, and maybe the Sackler family is the other agreed upon villain. It doesn't matter if you voted for Trump. It doesn't matter if you voted for Biden. It doesn't matter if you're so sick of the system that you didn't vote at all. Uh, everybody hates these guys and, and wants them brought to justice. It's interesting. I started a petition against Epstein and I had 36,000 signatures and um, about 42 anti-trafficking organizations behind me. And then I uh, put on a demonstration against Epstein or, or against the cover up right across the street from where Maxwell was being tried. And I had 64 anti-trafficking organizations behind me. And I was kind of stunned that there wasn't a bigger turnout. And I truly believe that America is a rotten apple. And if you bore down deep enough into Epstein, Epstein is going to be the wormhole that will get mm -hmm. you to the truth about our government. Um, and that's always been my belief on that. And we're never going to, as a, as a society, we're never going to have, a, I think, a a better opportunity at outing a power broker pedophile network. And I've been at this for 20 years and people are always coming up to me. Um, I've spoken at a number of conferences, anti-trafficking conferences, and 
people are always coming up to me talking about this network or that network and wanting me to investigate it. And, and I tell them I'm just one guy. And, yeah. um, and, and these networks get shut down so quickly, like we saw with the finders um, and Franklin took a while. And the only reason why Epstein turned into a, a blip on the radar is the Palm Beach police department refused to back down. Right. Michael Ryder, if it hadn't been for the Palm Beach Police Department, the whole thing would have been quashed and Jeffrey Epstein would be flying young girls around as we speak. But there's heroes in, in the Franklin scandal. There was a legislative subcommittee that wouldn't back down, um, even though their investigator that they had hired uh, was obviously murdered. And there were a number of strange deaths. Um, they still wouldn't back down. We didn't have anybody in the finders that was willing to uh, stick up for the truth. Well, actually, we had a there was a couple of um, custom agents that were willing to stick up for the truth, but they quickly got rolled over. But I think with Epstein, if you bore into the rotten apple that is America, you will find the maggots, and um, and I believe that that might be our last hope because that malignant corner of intelligence that perpetrates things like Epstein and other major crimes, they obviously have a tremendous amount of power. If they yes. can get, if they can get uh, the U S attorney to back down um, from pursuing Epstein, when the U S attorney has a list of 36 Epstein victims, that's the kind of power that this malignant corner of intelligence has. Um, they can just about get anybody to back down. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I do feel like he is the key, like he's the linchpin. You know, he's he and Maxwell combined are, are the people who open up, you know, a, a buried history that's partially emerged. I don't think people want to really deal with the ramifications of it. It's not just the history of the U.S. You know, it involves the U.K., Israel, Saudi Arabia, you know, all these countries around the world, all of these power brokers around the world, you know, the banking industry, BCCI, Deutsche Bank. I mean, you could go on and on because, the, you know, the tentacles are everywhere. He's the, uh, you know, the human version of the octopus. And I keep hoping that, you know, eventually there'll be somebody with the leverage to really bring this to the public. But honestly, you know, from what I see so far in terms of power for people, you know, their interests, their self-interest is wrapped up in keeping this um, under wraps. And the more time that goes by, I think the more it is to their advantage, you know, much like with the Craig Spence case, which was just kind of buried by time. But that was before the Internet, you know, and that's where I think the difference is, because the Epstein case is going to live forever unless there's really like a um incredibly powerful operation to shut it down and granted you're the guy who put it on Cocker and of course Cocker was sued out of business by um Peter yeah. Thiel I think because of that so you've seen the lengths to which people can go to try to control the internet but I think it's something new uh you know it, it's a double-edged sword because you see so much uh, propaganda so many lies disseminated but it's also a way people connect and they find the truth and there is so much interest in this and you know I hate to think that um you know our society the health and <laughs> welfare and, and unity of our society rests on us uh, uncovering a vast network of um, child rapist pedophile blackmailers. But sadly, that may be the case because it is the rot. And you do have to clear out the rot and you have to be forthright about who is complicit and who was quiet and who was willing to look the other way when these things happen and why they did it. And the reason for that is so we can keep it from ever happening again and to bring those who are still alive uh, to justice. I, I think it really matters. And I hope that other people do too. I hope this isn't just some sort of sensationalist story that they look at and kind of, you know, wonder what's up with that and then move on. Um, because it is so closely related to all the other issues affecting our governance, um, you know, and our lives and our, I don't know, our baseline sense of morality. What was really disheartening to me about Epstein was I thought if there was another Franklin because of the internet that people would insist upon the truth, because after all, you, you've got scores of children getting molested with impunity, but I found that that wasn't the case. And that really, uh, that was really, really disheartening to me. Yeah. That's been disheartening to me about a number of topics, you know, when the internet was new, 
you know, I, I sometimes when I talk about this, I feel like my parents talking about Woodstock or something. It's like, ah, the days of GeoCities where we all thought exposure, you know, would, would, uh, would force accountability, you know, that if you could bring forbidden, quote unquote, information or, or buried information to light, and people would feel compelled to act on it. They would feel like, oh, I can't get away with my crime anymore. This person must be held accountable. And that is not what has happened in the U.S. And it's not what has happened in other parts of the world. You know, you see these kind of fledgling movements, um, you know, pro-democracy, pro-justice and so forth. And people are incredibly brave to participate in those movements and to do that kind of journalism. But in terms of shifting power, you know, we've all been lurching toward autocracy. And I think one of the reasons for that is because of all these secrets emerging. You know, they need um, a stricter society. They need more suppression of freedom of speech. Um, You know, I, I think the only kind of answer to this is to continue to try and try all sorts of different methods. I mean, you never know. You never know who's going to pick this uh, stuff up and you never know who's going to get in power and do something with it. I do worry um, that it'll be exploited. You know, I don't like the way that the uh, Republican Party has handled these cases where I feel like they don't uh, actually care. You know, Bill Barr is an example of this, but they are willing to use it as kind of a weapon uh, to smear enemies instead of saying, hey, like, let's go down the list and look at absolutely everybody involved, regardless of party affiliation, regardless of wealth, regardless of status. Let's look at everybody involved, because I think that's the only way out. And this leads into, uh, I've got two more quotes of yours that I want to bring up. A country collapses under the weight of its own corruption. And what I see is, I read a book a number of years ago that was talking, that that looked at empires. And uh, the name of the book <clears throat> is escaping me at the time. I guess it's my, uh, my, my memory uh, getting geriatric. But... The author talked about the decline of empires and looked at Rome as as like the archetype. And he noticed that there were three things that were that the population was transfixed on sex, food and sports. And if you look at our society, um, we're very transfixed on sex, uh, probably you know, a sizable segment of the internet is dedicated to pornography. Um, Food is chefs have their own, chefs are superstars and they have their own television shows and sports, sports has become an opiate. The NFL has become an opiate. I played college football and I actually love football, but um, the NFL is an opiate. And I believe that a lot of, men live their manhood vicariously through their favorite NFL players or favorite athletes. I think that that's where we've come as a society. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And I think that we've also had a change, a real shift in the last five years with like, with entertainment in general and kind of a monoculture of escapism for America where it's not shared anymore. You know, I sometimes think about this in terms of, well, why are people turning to QAnon? What would they be doing instead? And I look at the loss of like, um, you know, big mainstream movies or the fall TV season or these kind of ritualistic entertainment pursuits that I grew up with my whole life. And I think people older than me, you know, kind of expected would last forever and how those are gone. And even during COVID sports was, you know, gone too. And so people's kind of mental sense of time and of ritual, uh, it was altered. And so I think they look to politics and they look to political scandals. And it's almost like everyone is the star of their own little reality TV series, which is a, you know, something that I think um, people in government try to cultivate. You see our Congress people, you know, looking more and more like they're auditioning for a reality show than they're actually governing. And it's not just Trump. I really kind of see this tendency everywhere. Um, and it's a terrible way to be, you know, it kind of taps into what I was saying before about you need to abandon your, your reputation. I think folks lock themselves into a a brand, you know, they see themselves individually as a brand, and they don't want to deviate from that through uh, curiosity, through civic inquiry, because it may upset what people um, have already deemed, you know, what what are you like? What do you represent? You know, who are you? I think it's unhealthy. It, it's like a combination of a surveillance society with a infotainment complex, and it leaves people 
kind of spiritually broken and adrift. Um, and so I think that they're drawn into causes that would otherwise be good. Like, let's, you know, investigate the abuse by the powerful. That is a good cause, but they're drawn in kind of the most exploitative way. Yes, uh, television would be uh, television as it manifests itself in the United States. I mean, Joseph Goebbels would be would be very impressed. I believe that uh, six corporations own 90% of the media that, that Americans imbibe. And the last quote of your, out of your book that kind of struck me is uh, very, very interesting is history was written by the winners and the winners were assholes. <laughs> you want yeah. to embellish that at all, or have yeah. we rehashed just, it enough? <laughs> no, I get, get, went straight to the point on that one. I mean, that, that came, I, I'm so sick of hearing history will judge them. I hear this over and over again. Obviously, we heard it throughout the course of the Trump administration. This is the excuse that people give for failures uh, in our institutions, for Mueller being a failure, Garland being a failure, everyone who came beforehand in terms of you know the cases that you and I look at being a failure. And so they look to the sort of illusory savior of quote unquote history. Um, and they also think that someday all of this will come out just naturally, you know, that's along with like the, the arc of justice, you know, naturally bends to progress or whatever that quote is. I, I think of the other Martin Luther King quotes, that justice delayed is justice denied. Um, but yeah, you know, the history of our time will be forcibly rewritten by those in power. And I'm honestly more worried about this now than I have been in previous times because of digital media. You know, there won't necessarily be book burnings, although some of them, those are happening. There'll be Kindle rewrites. You know, my fear is less my work being destroyed than my work being digitally altered and sold with a different conclusion under my own name. And I know that sounds very dystopian, uh, but I think you kind of need a dystopian imagination to navigate this world. You know, I at least need to think, well, that, that might be a possibility and what can I do to barricade myself against it, which is why I publish in a variety of, of formats, you know, hardcover books and podcasts. And I try to live, leave a trail behind, a trail other people can follow and they can pick up where I left off, um, you know, and they can find if the, uh, if the primary source was altered. Because, yeah, the folks writing the history of our time, they do not have uh, the best interests of the public at heart. Well, sir, I really want to thank you for coming on the Nick Bryan podcast. Oh, well, thank you for, for having me. Thank you for all of your decades of, of research and, and work. Uh, it's a great service and we all appreciate it.